Um, okay. And Mary, you'll keep an eye on any um, waiting room. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Um, we've had our little bit of, of chatting, which always feels so nice to have this bit of community before we start something, but I'll start our official introduction. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are all calling from. Um, I am really thrilled to welcome you to WEED's first art and science presentation. So officially, this is art and science number one, artistic musings of a disease ecologist, featuring the work of artist and scientist Nina Soklov. Um, I'm Anna McGarrigan. I'm WEED's staff person. I came on board with WEED last summer, and I have really loved being a part of this community. Uh, I'm a scientist. My background's in oceanography, um, and I'm also an art student in scientific illustration, so I'm especially thrilled to be launching this art and science series. It really plays to my personal interests um, lately, and the more I'm exploring how art and science come together in my own life, the more people I'm meeting, like Nina, who are doing the same. So that's been really exciting. Uh, and currently we are a couple of days away from the spring equinox and no ruse, the Persian New Year. So despite all the snow and ice and rain and everything we're all experiencing, um, this time of growth and renewal felt like a good time to begin our art and science series. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce Weed, and I'm going to read a land acknowledgement and cover a few Zoom housekeeping items. Um, and then I'll introduce Nina and hand things over to her. So to begin, Weed, Women Eco Artists Dialogue, which was founded in 1996, is a volunteer-run collective of female-identified visual artists, writers, curators, art historians, researchers, scientists, and others interested in highlighting the intersections of art and ecological issues. Um, today, we're joined by Mary White, who's one of our co-chairs. Um, and later in the presentation, she'll give us a little bit more information about what's currently happening at WEED. Um, and now we'll read our land acknowledgement. Feel free to add your own location and a land acknowledgement if you know it into the chat, if you'd like. Uh, Weed's office in Oakland sits on the territory of the Huichin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County, near one of the largest shell mounds in the Bay Area. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Mawekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. We recognize the Mawekma Ohlone tribe who are campaigning to become federally recognized, the association of Rameitush Ohlone who are researching, revitalizing, and preserving the Rameitush Ohlone history and culture, and the Confederated Villages of Lishan and Sogoreate Land Trusts who are working to return native land back to indigenous stewardship. And for our few Zoom housekeeping items, please keep your audio muted um, or a host may mute you if there's extra background noise and until the question and answer portion when we're all discussing the presentation. Um, we are recording this presentation today and what we'll do is stop this initial recording and start a second one for the question and answers at the end of the presentation. Um, that makes it easier to find what you're looking for if you're viewing the recordings later on. Um, and if you have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat and we will address them during the question and answer portion. And with all that said, uh, I am so happy to introduce Nina Sokolov. Uh, we met a few years ago when she was the president of the Women in Science grad group at UC Berkeley. Nina is a disease ecologist who fell in love with the world of insects when she started to draw them. With a microscope and a pen, she began studying pinned specimens from museum collections and becoming familiar with insect anatomy. Nina's currently a PhD candidate in biology at UC Berkeley, where she studies bees and their viruses to understand how diseases can be contributing to the declines of these important pollinators. She uses her artistic skills to determine the fine scale differences between species that can closely re resemble one another. Additionally, she has begun illustrating native bee coloring books to teach kids about the diversity of bees. So in this talk today, Nina will discuss how she uses art in her science to learn about the species she's studying, to communicate her findings to scientists and to the public, and to get people excited about insect conservation. 
And after her initial presentation, Nina will be doing a live drawing. We had to do a little bit of troubleshooting on how that would work, but she will do a drawing demonstration for us of a B. Um, and I think we'll do that while we are asking questions for her to answer about art, science, and bees. So Nina, thank you so much for being here with us for our first art and science. Um, welcome, and I will turn the conversation over to you. Thanks so much uh, for that great introduction. I'm really excited to be here with you all. Can you can you hear me okay? Great. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. How does that look? Oh, no, it's still loading. It's good. Is that yeah. cool? Great, seamless. Um, there were some technical difficulties for the later portion of the live drawing and everything. Usually I'm able to screen share my iPad, but it's thoroughly not wanting to right now. So we're gonna try and figure something out, but um, you can stick with me for that. Um, but thank you again for inviting me into this space. I'm really excited to share uh, my art side of my science. Um, normally, I don't really have many spaces to talk about this stuff really. I've been giving so many scientific presentations lately. And so I'll give a bit of introduction about that, about what I'm um, doing scientifically, and then how, how I'm integrating my art into that and a little bit of a history of how I got there in the first place. So I'm in the integrative biology department. I'm working on my PhD um, at UC Berkeley. And yeah, I'll get started if I can. Um, I don't know if anybody knows zines, but I also like making zines for educational material. So this is something that I made as an introduction for other things. But um, as I was already saying, I'm a PhD candidate and a disease ecologist, which means that I'm interested in where viruses exist in the ecosystem. Usually we think about, you know, you know, lions and wildebeest when we think of ecology, you know, predator prey stuff, but parasites and pathogens are also a really critical part of the food web um, that we're beginning to have the technology to start to study to see how they impact ecological um, factors as well. And where I focus that effort is I study how bees get one another sick with viruses by sharing flowers. And ultimately I wanna design management strategies to help bees survive into the future because um, pollinators are super important. Um, and I'll talk about that too. But I'm also an artist at the same time as this. And when I was little, I thought that those two things were going to be opposing. But in reality, it's been um, cool to combine those two things, even if uh, it's hard to <laughs> find the time and prioritize art while also getting my PhD. So I am uh, entomologist. I really like studying bugs and I really like using my art skills within my science to be able to communicate it better. So on the left is me at the B course, which is just a three week long or two and a half week long workshop to learn how to identify different groups of bees with a bunch of world specialists and just the nerdiest time that you can imagine of just being loopy in the desert for weeks at a time catching bees and only talking about them. <laughs> but on the right, you can see me at a, one of my first conferences where I'm using some of that artistic style in order to communicate my science. Um, so it does come in handy a lot of the time. So I'll explain more about that later. But first I wanna give a rundown about, a brief rundown about my research and why I'm studying bees in the first place. Um, as this time article suggests, bees are incredibly important um, both to pollinating wildflowers and to our agricultural system, and they haven't been doing too well lately. Um, we've seen losses in honeybees where in the 2018 winter, which I had an updated slide, but I don't have it anymore, but in the 2018 winter, we had an estimated 38% of managed honeybee colonies were lost in the US. So that's a lot of different hives that are being lost. Um, but due to honeybee management practices, we're able to mitigate those losses, which means that honeybee hive numbers in the US are actually increasing and they are worldwide as well. But the concern is that there's not enough to meet the demand of animal pollinated crops. So that's a managed species, the honeybee, and it's not native to North America at all. It was brought over by European colonizers in the 17th century. Um, and have since you know, spread all across the country and are even um, exist in the wild as feral colonies. And they have their own issues. They have agricultural issues. They are livestock um, versus, and those are very different issues than what wild native bees are facing here. So an example of one is Bombus franklini, um, which is at the brink of extinction. It's a bumblebee that hasn't been seen since 2006. 
And a more local example to California of Bombus occidentalis, which used to be the most abundant bumblebee in California and is now also trying to be listed as endangered. So these are all conservation issues and native bees are crucial for native flowers. Overall, a quarter of the 47 species of North American bumblebees are under threat. So with this, with any bee talk that I give, I like to highlight that there's this difference here. There's honeybee issues on the left, which is a management issue, livestock, they're non-native, but they are crucial for crops. And then there's the native bee issues, which are conservation issues. We know pretty much nothing about them because those two that I explained, those are bumblebees, those are the charismatic megafauna of insects, and so those are the best studied. But in California, there's actually over 1,600 species of native bees, bumblebees being only 24 of those. And for most of them, we just have no idea how they're doing. So I want to make that distinction because I study this intersection between the two of them where I wanna know what are the dynamics of virus spillover between managed and wild bee species. So anything can get infected by virus, even bacteria can get infected by viruses. And some of the declines that people are seeing in bees, both managed and wild, is in part due to disease and I focus on their viruses and see how they're sharing between managed and native bees. I focus on this nexus around the almond pollination event here in California. Um, California is actually responsible for over 80% of the world's almonds um, and it's our biggest export, uh, biggest agricultural export, which means that they require, it's a lot of almonds, it's a lot of land and it's a lot of bees that need to pollinate those almonds. And so every year, 60% of all honeybees in the US are actually shipped into the Central Valley where they pollinate all the almonds and then go back out across the country afterwards. And from a disease perspective, it's uh, exactly where I would evolve to be more deadly. So I track their viruses before, during and after the almond bloom. And then after the almond bloom, like I said, they can be exposed to new strains of viruses. And I wanna know and next the next part, do we start seeing those same viruses start to spill over into the native bees that they're interacting with after they leave the almonds? Um, I used to have to explain spillover more because before the pandemic, but now we're living through one. So it's the same thing. It's a new species, it's a be one species giving another species um, a new pathogen for the first time. Uh, yeah, I pretty much answered that. And there's many viruses, but pretty much they're called honeybee viruses because we found them in them initially, but we don't actually know their origin at all. Deformed wing virus is one of the major ones of interest. They can cause deformed wings, but that's pretty much the one that we're like, for sure, that seems like honeybee in origin. But there's many, many other viruses and we have no idea who is actually the, the primary host of those viruses. So there's like Sinai virus, which is associated with the almond sac root virus black queen cell virus that I focus on in my research. And I bring this up almost to just show this slide as well that I've illustrated. Um, as you can see, I kind of dramatized on the right um, some virus particles that are found commingling amongst the pollen. So that's how um, bees are getting different species sick. They're not directly necessarily interacting with one another. They're indirectly interacting with one another by going to a flower, shedding viruses onto them, leaving, and then another bee coming and eating up that contaminated pollen and potentially getting sick later. So it would be equivalent to a human who's sick, taking a drink from a cup of water, putting it down and then their roommate or something, I guess it did, in this analogy, it's a different species, but for the sake of the example, their roommate comes, drinks from that same glass of water and then they get sick. So it's this indirect environmental transmission that can happen. I work in a, the Sierra, and these are also my photographs, which is also a form of art. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd put them in here. Um, and I work up here for a number of reasons. One, because it's objectively gorgeous <laughs> and it's very nice to work there. But two, there's really high wildflower diversity and really high bee diversity. Um, I won't go further into why that's particularly interesting, but it's ecologically very interesting. And additionally, there's low honeybee um, density there. Pretty much it's not popular to be a beekeeper up there because of bears and um, feral hives have a hard time uh, surviving. So that means I can sample before and after managed honeybees arrive. And therefore I can see, do they bring viruses with them when they migrate? And do I, uh, are there any viruses circulating in the bumblebees before they get there? 
And then once they get there, do they spill over their viruses? Um, and how long, how fast does that happen? Um, I put this in here mostly just to, again, show how I'm using my art in science to demonstrate my sampling scheme. Um, Cause I could explain this all with a bunch of like a wall of text, but instead I illustrated a bunch of these points where I was sampling through the almonds on the left through time and everywhere there's a bee, there's a sampling event um, and sampling them at a stopover site and then the native bee community before the honeybees arrived and then subsequently um, after they've arrived. The last, so that's, you know, the almonds is part one, part two is the Sierra, part three is Marin County, which is just north of the Bay Area. It's a really short drive which is lovely, um, convenient for a field biologist such as myself to go and sample them regularly. Um, but unlike the Sierra stuff, I won't ever find a space pretty much without honeybees. Um, it's very, the honeybees can live in the wild there just fine. There's massive commercial operations from the pollinating almonds um, that I mentioned before. And there's also a lot of backyard beekeeping. This is a little map of my sites across the, um, like you can't, at the very bottom right corner, you start to see the B of Berkeley um, sticking out. But as you can see, it's a pretty short drive and I sample all across the, the county, across a few different sites, um, sites that either have feral honeybees there. So those that live in, without, in a, not in a box, they're not taken care of by humans at all. They just live in the wild. Um, and then the bumblebees that they interact with. And then I compare those to sites that have these commercial large scale operations where there's you know, hundreds of hives. And then I sample the bumblebees that they're interacting with as well to see is there an effective management strategy? Um, and essentially are feral honeybees worse at spilling over viruses or are commercial honeybees worse at spilling over viruses? Are they both not um, great when it comes to that? Or, you know, how can we manage honeybees as a livestock animal in a better way to protect the native bees that they're interacting with? And again, using those same sort of illustrations from before to show my sampling scheme um, through time. Um, so that's my research. I can pause there for a second if there's any, I, mean, I guess there's Q&A at the end, maybe I should just keep going. But if you have any science-y questions, um, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, but I just wanted to lay the groundwork for what I'm doing, how I've integrated my art into that. And then, I can talk more about the art side of things coming up next. So as I am showing here, just kind of some pictures of me that illustrate that I'm, you know, both a lab scientist, but I also am an artist at the same time. And it's, it's very kind of nice to be able to find outlets where I can combine those two things, which is wonderful why I can, you know, chat about that stuff here. Um, first off, I can use my artistic skills and outreach where I designed a scientific illustration workshop for a, a class of fifth graders, where you can see here that I'm illustrating just on a little whiteboard and the kiddos were learning along with me. Um, also during the pandemic, I um, worked with the same Bay Area scientists in schools, but everything had changed to virtual um, and the final uh, class with these students was kind of making a project for them. And so I had them design little, uh, pretty much bee sanctuaries where they got to, where I made these worksheets where they got to pick out their different, their favorite bee and how they can really help bees is um, planting flowers through different times of the year. So find their favorite springtime flower, um, summertime flower and fall time flower and draw them all together in um, essentially a, yeah, this bee sanctuary that I was talking about before and also choosing their nest material because lots of solitary bees use different things to line their nests with. Um, I also forgot about the fact that kids do, um, what are those? I keep forgetting the name of them, but it's like a di dioramas <laughs> where like they like designed all of this in there. And so that was really fun and a fun way to integrate the art and the science for the kiddos even over virtually over Zoom, um, which I thought was really fun. I do uh, outreach with this communication and literacy and educational, uh, communicate, oh my God, it's too long of an acronym, literacy and education and agricultural research. Um, and so initially I was tabling with them, you know, teaching the public at either uh, like Earth Day events at the zoo or at a local farmer's market um, or at um, science festivals, things like that. 
And I was always kind of wanting to do a um, outreach project with them, um, which kind of created to this, this collaboration, which I've continued on since then, where I could design like a tabling booth for outreach so kids can learn more about bees and my research and everything and to do little games. And, you know, you can hand out stickers, you can do that sort of stuff, of course, but there's a bit more of a monetary situation for that of course, whenever you're designing and buying your own stickers. So instead I thought that I can use some of my artistic skills to also design coloring book pages um, because that also gives me an opportunity to stare at these bugs and, and you know, draw them, which is, I'm like, I'm studying, I'm pretty much studying right now. Um, but also it lets kids um, get to know these different forms of bees, these different species that they might not have otherwise thought were bees in the first place. Um, this is the yellow-faced bumblebee, Bombus wasmsenskii, which is the most common bumblebee that you'll see around here, which I thought it was important to illustrate. And on the back of the little page, um, there's like an illustration. No, it means a draw. Oh my God. <laughs> there's a photograph as well as some uh, fun facts about them as well as um, a little bio description. So this is how it kind of started. And I even did a event for the Bay Area Science Festival in 2020, again, having to switch from doing this activity in uh, real life to over Zoom, but I thought it worked pretty well. And the kiddos that joined in for the workshop, pretty much I was doing what I'm gonna be doing later and which I thought my iPad could handle, but I guess it hasn't handled in a long time, 2020. It doesn't seem so long ago, but it is. Um, and I was doing this after presenting a little video about native bees, I was drawing this image. And then I um, had two of my friends, one professor from Colorado State and one postdoc um, from Nebraska, just answer the live Q&A questions from um, the kiddos there. And then we did on the right, you can see a native bee, like uh, the color, be colorful is the name of the activity. And you could either print out those um, pages at home, we had them available as PDFs, or I was like, I don't even have a printer, you know, this is technically an inaccessible activity for me. But I told the kids that you can do the same thing that I did when I was drawing. Um, and you can just look at the picture, look at the drawing that I did and try to draw it yourself. So you can see kind of a mix of both like digital coloring, marker coloring, as well as some uh, um, like, you know, traditional <laughs> watercolor and colored pencil and stuff too. So I thought that was really fun. And whenever kid, whenever I see the kiddos um, using my coloring book pages, they're so cute. And I've pretty much um, started collaborating also with the Lawrence Hall of Science, which is a science museum here in Berkeley. And they do um, science at Cal events and they do tabling also at, this is a local street festival, street fair that happens on a nice um, street in Berkeley called Solano. So it's called the Solano Stroll. So we had, you know, illustration posters about bees and a trivia game about bees. And then kids could take the coloring book pages and um, color them in or take them home or anything like that. So it's just kind of a nice way to get the word out about these different um, species of bees that we have. And I would love to, um, you know, continue creating a coloring book moving forward. I have, um, you know, a handful of species so far, but as I mentioned before, there's 1600 species in California. It's of course been in reach of carrying capacity as very few people could tell all those different bees apart. But I think even having like a short coloring book or something like that would be really fun and intermingle them with um, activity games within that booklet. And it can be something that kids can work on at home or if they're homeschooled or and need activity books, or if they have, um, teachers that are trying to teach them about pollinators and things like that. Um, I'm pretty much wanting to go in that kind of vein with this project. Um, so that's, I guess, in summary, you've seen how I use some of my art in science and using it for presentations, for posters, uh, even for papers, I can um, draw figures for that as well. And I think I've even popped in um, a couple of those that I'll mention later, but it's really helpful to be able to communicate and engage with people um, when I'm giving those presentations or posters. And additionally, I'm able to integrate the art that I like into communicating about these organisms that I'm really passionate about, you know, in the first place. I'm talking and connecting to the community that 
And people around here really love these and they love talking about them and they might not even know very much about them. So it's like this nexus that I find very interesting to teach a lot of people about. And there are people are already kind of immediately interested in learning more. People tend to love bees. Um, and so I feel lucky to be able to be working on an insect that is so uh, charismatic, I guess. The next section as I kind of dive more into the art is kind of describing how I got to this place in the first place. Um, I guess backing up even further when I was a kid, I never took, I never got formally trained or anything. I was mostly just the, you know, weird goth art kid in school that had a bunch of friends that also loved to do art. And so we would just do art together and hang out and be doodling all over our pages and stuff. And so just you know, practicing since I was about in the middle school, I guess. And so you really just are not good for so long, but then eventually you get the dexterity and you can get a lot of, quite a bit better. So no formal training up to that, just kind of using it as a hobby really and like taking art classes in high school and things like that. But then this crazy image that I guess I should explain is on the right, this jagged building. If anybody's ever been to Toronto, there's the Royal Ontario Museum and this, is a natural history museum like you can see the collections on the left um, which ho is housed to a bunch of entomology collections mammalogy paleontology you name it and I was volunteering there for a bit and I was also then later taking a museum studies course and I found I should have put in an image of this but when we were giving it getting a tour once we found this um, it's called a camera lucida which is a microscope that has an attachment piece to it that when you look into it you can see both what would be under the microscope as well as um, your hand on a piece of paper kind of overlaid next to one another. And so you can put a specimen under the scope and outline it. It's not like that great of resolution, of course. And then um, you can get the exact proportions. And so this is where I was like, who does this? Who can teach me how to use this thing? Because I didn't know that, like I was assuming everyone's just, and I do this as well as like you look in the microscope, you go down, you look in the microscope, you go down. But it's very helpful to have just the proportions to be exactly right because with scientific illustration it's not even about looking beautiful it's like about looking perfect um so i befriended a um phd candidate there julio rivera dr julio rivera um, who was using illustration for his dissertation where he was describing new species of praying mantises and i was like can you teach me how to use this thing <laughs> Um, and he did. And he was one of like, you know, he was a you know, hard teacher in the sense that this was my first thing that I tried illustrating where it's a chrysotoxin flab, no, not flavifrons, chrysotoxin. It's a hoverfly, essentially. It might look like a bee to you, but do not be fooled. On the left, you can see that it has these huge eyes, which bees eyes are way smaller and has these teeny, tiny, stubby antenna. Bees have way longer antenna. And although it's yellow and black, it's not fuzzy. Bees are fuzzy, except some, <laughs> which we don't need to get into right now. But then this was my, this is not the same specimen that I was using. I was just getting a combination of my illustrations with some photos online. And we did it old school style where we got layers and layers of transparent paper. And I would move, because as you can see here, the specimen on the left, it has some you know, legs kind of under it. It's not perfect because when the entomologist is pinning it, it's a lot of effort to get it looking like a pristine, perfect thing. And some people are really obsessed with that. Um, I am not. And so instead what you can do is position the uh, insect in a certain way such that the body part that you're interested in is perfectly placed. And then pretty much have a series of tracing paper that you've built, like that you've drawn all the different and perfect parts and the positions that you want. And then you overlay them all at once. And then you do a final drawing over all of those. So this on the right was after, I kid you not, months, you know, like of studying this thing. So I came out pretty good for my first try, but it's a lot of stippling work and it's a lot of work to get to this point in the first place. And I was like, whoa, you know, that is an insane amount of work. Um, but I really liked it. And it made me look at insects under the microscope, which I feel like people are like, eh, bugs, you know, they gross me out they're kind of gross but I feel like if they were larger they people would be like much more intrigued by them I mean maybe I'm just biased but like this insect on the left it's a uh ant mimicking tree hopper which I don't even know if you have I can if you can see my cursor or not actually but 
it has this projection off of its back that's all black that from the top looks exactly like an ant but below just try to imagine if there's a cicada there you know like it's got a cicada body it's a true bug considered a hemipteran um, but they're teeny teeny tiny and this is actually the what i was viewing under the microscope um, and this is how i illustrated it i didn't do the legs because they were getting them perfect is just too much so you see that the three um, ends just kind of finish off but they have this long um, proboscis that you can see sticking out to the bottom and this was again the same sort of thing where I didn't have to get it as perfect because as you can see the 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 body is pretty much the same as what it is in the in the microscope image on the left and then I just flipped it around at the front and that's the front view of the organism but I would think that if more people saw bugs under microscopes they'd be like well you know like these are aliens amongst amongst us and I want to know more about them at least that was my experience, you know. Um, this was actually quite for like, I don't even know, I haven't even thought of this being so serendipitous, but in between undergrad and grad school, I took a couple of years off and worked. Um, and while I was doing that and while I was learning illustrations, one of my friends commissioned me to do this bumblebee, um, Bombus Affin, Aff, like the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, yeah, Bombus Affinus. Um, which was the first bee to be listed as endangered in the continental US. And I hadn't even started working on bees yet. Like I didn't, I never have worked on bees. I didn't know that that's what I was going to study for my PhD, but he commissioned me for this endangered bumblebee. Um, and it kind of, you know, has set me on the more sense really. And I even work with an endangered bumblebee now. Um, so it was quite fortuitous. Uh, this is the kind of same process I use the first two images here that I showed you, um, and I realized I actually forgot to add one in, which is a shame, but this is the old school style camera lucida, perfect taking months of effort, you know, of studying this thing, going for like one hour stunts at a time to the museum, you know, that kind of thing. Um, this was mostly just staring under a microscope and um, getting the, the, you know, proportions right, as right as I could, and then finishing it off with, um, to not be stuck at a museum for hours at a time uh, at home using photographs as my reference images. This is a Pepinapis squash bee. Um, so here's the effectively an image, not the one that I used. This one I also was just like staring back and forth at that aforementioned bee course where we were in the desert for a few weeks and sketching it out. So less perfect, but a digital version rather than a pen and ink illustration. And the crazy projection that you see out of its mouth is the bee's tongue. Um, so different bees have different lengths of tongues, co-evolving with flowers, that type of thing. Um, but that was a little out of timeline, but just all showing kinds of different ways that I use scientific illustration. And again, this is much, I'm going, I guess this is the, the pattern is I'm going much from like, these are the perfect, you know, I really slaved over these to be working for hours and hours to make them perfect. Um, and they get a little bit less perfect, um, all from the amount of time that you dedicate and the um, reference material that you had. Like, I think these two I was just doing from a uh, image, which is great, but you just have those 2D elements. You can't really figure out because bugs are all these weird different layers. You can't really figure out and do this a proper study on them as well. But all to show that these are kinds of the ways that I illustrate insects. Oh, I did put it in here. Um, I wish I had put the image because for all of these things, I feel like people are like, what am I even looking at? Um, this is the side of a crane fly. Like, you know, those things that, I mean, I guess I haven't seen one around here in a long time, but they look like mosquitoes. People call them mosquito eaters. They're huge. Um, but their legs also pop off really immediately. So that's why they're all absent. But the, my teacher was showing, was using me, like, well, was using this as an example to show them, to see how to um, make these grooves in their, like their, their, um, their body has all these like grooves of plates. And so this was kind of a study on how to add those um, three-dimensional layers using stippling. Um, so again, a lot of effort on this one. Um, and the rest of this, I guess, will just turn into like a little bit of an art show. And if anybody has any questions about how I use my techniques, but I'll try to explain. This was all in colored pencil. Like I said, I'm a disease ecologist now. So especially during the pandemic, I was like thinking and thinking a lot about like origins of COVID. And so like these were um, the three initial 
really important animal species, although the pangolin is now out as a possible um, uh, origin of COVID instead as raccoon dogs is most likely the thing. So this is just at a snapshot at that moment, but using colored pencil instead. And I'm like the type of artist to also bonk around to a bunch of different styles and mediums and I can't really like focus too well on one thing which is why a coloring book in totality is daunting because I love to work on a million different types of things at once block printing um painting on leather colored pencil wash watercolor you know it's just all over the place a little bit but these are floral um studies using colored pencil these were digital a digital and a watercolor version of the same um beetle that i was studying in undergrad actually um, as a possible biocontrol of an invasive plant and this is about the digital illustration side of things um, which i find very powerful kind of convenient um, but i mean people have lots of opinions of digital versus traditional mediums but i like i said love to um, act on both this one i meant to have an animation but in the back you see a study of a red panda that I also did in a biological illustration class. And in the front is a paramiscus deer mouse that I designed for a lab t-shirt when I was working in the deer mouse lab. And here's a digital illustration of a paper that's not out yet, but kind of showing the difference on the left of a honeybee and this idea that if they can get covered in these mites that vector viruses, the more vector, the more varroa, which is the vectors, density is on the honeybees, then the worse for spillover it is in the bumblebee community that they're interacting with. But we advocate for control of the varroa mite as much as possible, not just for the honeybees benefit, um, but for the bumblebees that are in that community. So this paper is hopefully gonna come out soon, but again, showing how I'm using digital illustration to communicate some of my science. Um, but this is all kinds of, um, an attempt at productive procrastination, I suppose, of being like, I can justify spending time, you know, it's like so messed up. Science like makes you be like, I have to be, you know, productive at all, at all times. Otherwise, like I can't do it. Um, so all that you've seen before is kind of, I'm like, this is tangentially related enough to science that I can um, justify it. But I also have this, uh, more fun and free form uh, art style that I consider industrial naturalism that I've just, um, I do it as more of a creative expression. It's all in pen and ink, um, which is probably my favorite medium out of all of them if I had to choose one, um, where I will find an animal uh, or subject of interest and take its outline and just like, that's what's, you know, Scientific illustration can be very exhausting because you're like, wow, I'm studying this thing for hours and it has to be perfect and all these things. It can't have hairs coming out here. It has to be here, you know, those sorts of details. But this is more, I can quickly sketch this down. And then the parts that I fill in are more from my head and they have, um, again, more like industrial themes to them, um, human made materials, metal, plates, lace, rope, those kinds of things. And so here is a leafy sea dragon that I illustrated in the reference. Um, a seahorse with the same sort of style. Um, this is, a, I call it a mechanical bull, again, with all of these plates that are attached with ropes underneath and um, different sorts of metal parts to them. And I did a screen print of this actually, which came out pretty good. Um, so maybe screen printing would be fun of any of these designs into the future. And a crane. Um, dragonfly, and then, oh, did I not have it? Yeah, and then the, um, the, the illustration that was done for this event in the first place, um, which showed a parasitoid wasp and a ladybug was also done in the same sort of style. And uh, it was actually, this probably could be interesting to this group generally, um, but the big national, con international, I guess at the time, conference for entomology is called the Entomological Society of America. And this past year it was hosted in Vancouver and co-hosted with the Canadian Society. And the theme was uh, insects in art and culture this year. And it was so good. They had, um, workshops of scientific illustration. They had 
Um, local educators come and talk about how they use insect and art in their classrooms. They had documentary screenings. They had indigenous dancers opening the plenary session. They had um, just, yeah, all kinds of lovely different workshops, zoom making workshops and everything. And so it was the first time that I was like, whoa, like this is like a massive interconnect. And they even had a drag show, which I participated in, um, which was really fun. Uh, but it was the first time that I saw this like hyper academic space take on um, art in such a serious and, you know, uh, conscientious kind of effort to show how they're so complementary. You know, they don't have to be siloed and they can actually do a really good job of um, moving um, the other one forward. So I thought that that was a lot of fun. And they also had an art, I brought that up because they had an art show, which is what I drew the, um, the cover image for this event for. So it's happening, there's this becoming this integration, people are validating that art is a really great way to communicate science and science is a really cool tool to inform art as well. It can be a back and forth sort of reciprocal relationship and even there's more of a push towards um, graphical abstracts for papers for people who are more visual thinkers to understand it better um, so it's kind of beginning to happen now of more of an integration of those two things rather than having them to be two very separate things even though the history of scientific illustration you know suggested that these two things should be intertwined but after cameras got you know, better and cheaper, nice photographs were um, kind of cheaper than hiring a illustrator, but I can, you know, go on for why I think it's important to have illustrators, of course, today. Um, but overall, I'm very pleased to be able to use art in my research, in my outreach, and of course, in my own personal time um, as well. And I'm hoping to, in my career, find a way to continue tying those things together. Um, and so with that, I will open it up to any questions. I'll start for just a moment here. Nina, that was fabulous. Thank you. I'm hesitant to like interrupt the flow because I, I feel like I've been sitting here with my mouth hanging open, both the, all the B information and the illustrations. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it to Mary for just a moment to get our weed fundraising information. And then I'm going to stop and start the um recording for the question and answer and that'll give everybody just like a couple of minutes to gather their thoughts for questions um and if you want to sort of check your technical um connection to draw for us um i know i have like so many things i want to ask you that was wonderful so mary i'm gonna i'm gonna turn things over to you for a moment and then i'll stop and start the recording and then we'll take questions um does that right. sound right okay perfect nina thank you so much it was just be aware what a wonderful, wonderful uh, ending and beginning and um, so vibrant and fresh. Um, and thank you audience for coming. And if you've enjoyed the presentation, um, we hope that you will donate to WEED to support more art and science programming. And please give generously, it's weedartist.org and we'll put the link in the chat. Uh, Weed's vision is to continue for another decade as our global network of women activist artists grows to provide a platform for unheard women's voices. Um, reminder to look at our current magazine, The Art of Empathy. And uh, Weed is also a volunteer organization, a, a volunteer collective, and we're looking for volunteers to help with a monthly newsletter and work on our WordPress website. And if you have suggestions for other uh, speakers, please uh, send them to us at info at weedartist.org. So uh, thank you again, Nina. We'll now close this recording and immediately start the question and answer recording. So please put your questions and comments in the chat. Thank you. All right, I'm going to...